For many years, I've been interested in using the geological record to document the early history of Earth and life. Now, you wrote a book. I did. I, I wrote a book, conveniently right here, called Life on a Young Planet. And that book summarizes much of the work we've done and, and tries to lay out the procedures by which we interrogated ancient rocks and the kinds of evidence that we used to draw conclusions about the early Earth. Early Earth. Now, er with life on a now, early Earth, that means three billion years ago, four billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago. Yeah, early Earth is, is kind of a misnomer uh, because it refers to the time of Earth history before the oceans were full of animals that left conspicuous fossils. Now, it turns out that that's about 85% of recorded history. So if you look at our planet's history in its entirety, our biological history is basically microbial. All right, microbe. So are you a microbe? Uh, no, but I have plenty inside my body. Uh, if, if you put a bag around your own body and count all the cells inside that bag, bacteria will outnumber cells of a human being by about 10 to 1. How about so, viruses? Uh, uh, there are many, many viruses as well. Uh, it's been estimated, in fact, that if you look at the genetic content of the oceans, more than 90% of the genes are actually found in viruses and the percent that are actually found in animals is very small. So the important point, I think, is that when we walk around, the conspicuous part of our biological landscape are plants and animals, but they are something of the tip of a, a much larger and more interesting iceberg that is mostly things that are tiny. Mostly things. Now, are we alone? We really don't know if we're alone, and, and I, I think there's a good analogy to be made, and that is, let's say that for the first time in your life, you buy a lottery ticket, and you don't know anything else about anybody else who's bought a lottery ticket, and you win, and you get a million dollars. Now, knowing nothing else, you might conclude that, well, if you buy a lottery ticket, you win a million dollars, but other people who know how many people bought lottery tickets would say, Gosh, that's a rare event. And, and that's, the, I think, the dilemma we find ourselves in when we ask whether we're alone. Um, you know, when you look around, you basically see all the unambiguous evidence for life that we know about in the universe. We're it. And so that leaves open the question of, is life truly rare? And we just happen to be here, so we, we uh, are living on a, we're on a, on a living planet, or if we had ways of looking for it, might we find life in many other places? So the short answer is we just don't know whether we're alone or not. Um, fortunately, for the first time in Earth history, that's an empirical question. You can actually go out and look, and we can actually go to other planets in our solar system. Uh, a number of agencies have, have gone to Mars. There's also interest in some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. We can look for planets in other solar systems and hope that things like their atmospheric content might give away a signature of life. And for the other 99% of the universe, we can just listen and see if anyone tells us they're out there. So my, my suspicion is that life is distributed throughout the universe, but demonstrating that to be true or false is a pretty tough problem. Well, if I gave you $100 billion and said, so you can spend this on the condition that you will help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would probably do more solar system exploration, the places we can actually go to, although I suspect that the probability of success in that kind of venture is certainly not zero, but it's not high either. And then I, I suspect, well, here, here's the problem. The one thing we can see of biological relevance when we look at planets that are being discovered at a, at a high rate in in other solar systems is potentially we'll be able to see their atmospheres. We can get some sense of their temperatures from uh, 
the distance from the star that they're orbiting and things like that. But of, of, for a real biological signature, I think we're stuck with looking at atmospheres. And so then it becomes a question of, is there such a thing as an unambiguous atmospheric signature for life? And I don't think we know the answer to that in any detail. So I'd probably spend some of that $100 billion getting better sensors to get a more comprehensive and quantitative sense of the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. And then I'd at least give some of it to organizations like SETI because, as I said, even the extrasolar planets that we're seeing are fairly close to us in terms of the entire universe. And for the, the universe writ large, really just uh, asking is anybody out there may be the only way we'll ever know. I, I asked this question of an Indian student, and he said uh, he'd invested in uh, reducing poverty and getting rid of, uh, I don't know, teaching other people about other cultures. And he says, that because we might kill ourselves, and the best way to find extraterrestrials is to survive long enough to do it. So he's very concerned that we won't survive. Would that be part of your strategy as well? Well, I, I think that's a... Or you just assume that was the case. That's, that, that's, that's a great, great answer. No, I've, I've assumed in my answer that we are going to be here. Uh, I am slightly more optimistic than the student <laughs> you just described in, in thinking that, uh, that we will be here over intervals of hundreds or thousands or, or more years. Um, do I think that $100 billion was, was better spent on alleviating poverty or looking for life in the universe? I think I would probably put most of it into alleviating poverty, but that's a different issue. <laughs> Well, he didn't think it was a different issue. That's the point. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I think I do think it's a different issue. But that's okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Now, I talked to an economist. I asked yeah. him the same question. Yeah. I said, oh, you know, and he said, well, I'd put it in the bank. I said, well, why would you put it in the bank? I said, I'm giving you this money on the condition that you help look for, answer the question, are we alone? And he says, well, it's not an important question. It's some questions are important and urgent and others are not. That's not an urgent question. We don't need to do it. I'll invest it until it becomes urgent. What do you, so the bottom line is, my question to you is, is this an important question? I think it's an important question, which, which is not synonymous with calling it an urgent question. But I, you know, I think there are a small number of grand questions that humans are capable of, of, of asking. Um, how did life originate is one of those. How is life distributed through the universe is uh, another one of them. And I think it's, it, it says something about us as a species that we devote at least some resources to tackling these largest questions. You know, it's, it's not clear that the amount of funding that's going to go into answering these questions is going to be large in the real world. Uh, there's a lot more funding that goes into trying to cure cancer, which is arguably more urgent if if uh, not a larger question. So I, I, I think that, you know, in some ways, we are fortunate that we live in societies that are willing to devote a small number of resources to some bright people to ask those big questions. I, I, I think if we ever found out that we are not alone in the universe, that would be seen as an important discovery by most people in the world. So, but knowing, knowing about how we got here, do you think that makes you a better person? I'm not sure what makes me a better person, but you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, discovering what causes pancreatic cancer makes me a better person. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that's. If I have pancreatic cancer, yes, it would make me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I. I, I, I do think that a world in which we come to understand what we can about nature, about the, you know, what goes on beyond our planet is, is interesting. I, I think it, 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 it's good for us all, you know, whether it's more or less important than, than Shakespeare, I can't tell you, but you know, 
Shakespeare isn't urgent either, but I think most people would argue that Shakespeare has helped us all. So what do we know about the earliest evolution of life on this planet? For example, when did life get started? Okay, well, the important thing to know is that Earth is a fairly poor bookkeeper, so that sediment, sediments laid down on the seafloor through time actually provide a record of life and environments, and they turn into sedimentary rocks, and we see them in canyons and can look at the physical and chemical characteristics of those rocks and say something about life and environment. Um, the reason I said that Earth's a poor bookkeeper is that it erases the books as it goes along. Mm -hmm. So through time, sediments that formed in one interval may get eroded and destroyed in another interval. And not surprisingly, as you go back further through time, the record gets smaller and smaller because the more of the record has been destroyed. Um, all of which is a prelude to say that the oldest rocks that we can look at profitably, just look for evidence of life, actually have evidence of life in them. There are some wonderfully preserved and exposed rocks in northwestern Australia that are between 3.4 and 3.5 billion years old. There are equivalent rocks in southern Africa. And when you look at those, they contain chemical signatures that I think are best explained in terms of a biological carbon cycle and a biological sulfur cycle, all driven by microorganisms. We also see things like this. Uh, now, this is a little bit younger. This is about 2.7 billion years old, also from Western Australia. But it's a very unusual structure. This is basically a limestone. And you see these laminated structures that bow upward, making this uh, kind of bat-shaped structure. And this is something called a stromatolite. And if you look around the Earth today, the only processes that we know of that are capable of making this kind of structure that we'll preserve in rocks are processes that involve microbial mat communities. So that's a microbial mat community right there. Uh, it's it's it the works. history of a microbial mat community through time. How much so is So this treating? is accreting. This probably represents maybe a few thousand years. A few thousand is um, very slow growing then. It, it is a slow growing and it's discontinuously growing. Um, oh. But the important thing is... Can you show us a discontinuity? Well, I think if, I'm not sure that you, you can see them, but if you would look closely at some of these, you would see that some of the laminae actually cut each other. So oh. there, are, there are breaks in the system. Are they annual or? Uh, we, we don't really know. If you look today, there are places where you'll see a lamina forms seasonally, another one the lamina forms every day, a third one the lamina forms every time there's a storm. Uh, and then laminate. Really? Can and you can't tell which of those it is? No, you really can't from this. But, the, but let's not lose sight of the, of the important thing here. And that is because the only known processes, or the only processes that we know of that can give rise to this kind of structure involve biology, when we see something like this in the rock record, it is a fingerprint of life. And we can see this kind of record back to about these oldest rocks at three and a half billion years old. So the long and the short of it is that when the curtain goes up geologically, life is already there. Now that thing is domed. I, I'm thinking right. if, if I'm a photosynthetic mat, I would not be a dome. I should be something like this. Photocells, for example, are flat and they're pointed at the sun. Now that right. doesn't seem to be doing that. Well, one of, one of the things uh, that's involved here, too, is that the organisms that, that make this, and remember, each of these laminations was built by an entire community of, of interacting cells. They are not only looking to gather life, but they also have to gather nutrients. Mm -hmm. And so that involved their interaction with currents, and actually getting up above the seafloor can be helpful in that regard as well. Okay, so 2.7. Yeah. So. Now but the, again, the bottom line is that at least back to three and a half billion years ago, and on the basis of some more fragmentary evidence, perhaps significantly before that, 
microbial life existed on Earth. Um, in some ways, maybe the most interesting thing we can say about that life is that it functioned without oxygen gas. Uh, the geochemical record tells us pretty unequivocally that for the first billion or more years of life, uh, microbes lived beneath an atmosphere that had essentially no oxygen in it. And so that's a very different world from the one we know. Now, when you look at these things 2.7, 3, 3.5 3 billion years ago, you, your record, as you say, is getting sparser and sparser. Right. But I'm not interested in where, how old your fossil is. I'm interested in how old life is. Right. And so you have to make a guess based on when you found this fossil and based on the sparseness, how much, uh, how earlier, how much earlier did that thing exist? And so, for example, those stromatolites, when do you think, make a guess, not at when the earliest one you detected is, but when do you think the earliest one was? Well, it's pretty unconstrained. We, we know that the Earth accreted a little more than four and a half billion years ago. We know we have this unambiguous record at three and a half billion years that life is present, um, in particular in some rocks that are highly metamorphosed, which in plain English means they have been cooked uh, in, in southwestern Greenland. There is some carbon whose chemistry suggests that it could have been made biologically. So that would pull you back a little bit. When you say but, chemistry, you mean C12, C13 yes, ratios? Yes, that's right. The, carbon, the isotopic composition of the carbon is consistent with some sort of process like photosynthesis. But are, but are the distributions of C12 to C13 ratios unambiguously biological? I thought that the distributions kind of overlap at a large degree, and so you know how significant it's, is Well, th this, is, this gets at, at an interesting question. If you do the famous Miller-Urey experiment, where you start with CO2 and methane and, and you reduce it by non-biological processes to make amino acids and other simple organic compounds, there will be carbon isotopic fractionation that accompanies that process. So the ratio of C13 to C12 in those amino acids is a little bit lower than it was in the, in the parent materials that made them. Now, it turns out that there are a number of non-biological processes known. Uh, people have measured the kinds of carbon isotopic fractionation that's associated with them. And the fractionation is very much dependent on specific conditions at the the time and place that this is going on. So I, my expectation would be that if carbon fixation were non-biological, A, I'd expect the fixed carbon to be located in places where chemistry can make that happen, say a mid-ocean ridge or something like that. And B, I would expect the carbon isotopic fractionation to vary a lot from one place to the next. Um, just because as the conditions change, the fractionation will change. What we actually see in three and a half billion year old rocks are through hundreds of meters of sedimentary rock that are distributed over hundreds of kilometers in space, we have a fair amount of organic matter that is isotopically almost uniform. And I think it's very hard for me to understand that pattern without invoking something like photosynthesis. How about for sulfur? For sulfur, it becomes a little bit more complicated because in a world that has no oxygen, there are chemical processes that go on in the atmosphere that impart uh, an interesting and sort of fingerprintable uh, pattern of isotopic fractionation in sulfur. So, Commonly, you know, back when I was a kid, people would look at two isotopes of sulfur, sulfur-34 and sulfur-32, and would assume that you didn't have to measure sulfur-33 and 36 because any kind of isotopic fractionation would be mass-dependent, which is to say, if you know the ratio between two things of known mass, you can calculate how much of, of an isotope of another mass would be. That breaks down with these photochemical processes. And so now you actually have to look at all four stable isotopes of sulfur. And when you do that, you can see that a good deal of the fractionation that's actually found by measuring 
sulfur in very old rocks can be accounted for by these uh, photochemical processes in the atmosphere. But there are some details of that distribution that seem to make sense only if superimposed on this strong physical set of processes, you also have biological processes, in particular things that will take sulfur or perhaps the sulfate ion and reduce it to hydrogen sulfide. That imparts a, 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 an identifiable fractionation. So uh, again, because of this complication, it's a little bit harder to ferret out exactly what's going on. But I think it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to look at the totality of that record without concluding that life has a hand in there somewhere. Okay. And um, how about in the earliest evolution of life or the emergence of life, uh, there's a debate about which came first, the information, the RNA world, or metabolism, the, right. like the garbage bag world. I guess there's all, even the membrane first, people. Right. So how, where, what are your views on this? Well, it's, it's, it's a hard question. As, as you said, uh, a lot of origin of life research or prebiotic chemical research has traveled down this avenue of information. That is, you know, one can actually make nucleotides, one can string them together into uh, sort of functional uh, nucleic acids, they can be evolved, and you can actually get some fairly sophisticated behavior, if you will, of those chemical systems. Now, all of that is, on, is based on information and replication. What it doesn't help you to understand is where's the energy coming from? How are organisms learning to transduce that energy, uh, you know, energy from the environment and make it into chemical energy that they can use to do work in the cell? So there are people who look at models of the early Earth and identify places where natural chemical gradients might have existed and try to understand how that might have provided a template for uh, early energetics within a cell. And then, as you mentioned, the, the, the other part is what separates the cell from the rest of the world, which is the membrane. And people, I think, have made good progress on each of these three lines of inquiry. And where we haven't made much progress is where they merge. You know, because if you look at a modern cell, yes, it has information. It also has energy metabolism. It also has uh, a membrane that separates it from the rest of the world. And in fact, the membranes and the, and the structural proteins and the uh, metabolism is all coded for in the informational molecules. So I think that the big um, challenge for origin of life work is not to argue endlessly about which came first, because I, I don't think it's necessarily an interesting or answerable question, but to understand how the three components of life as we know it became intertwined in the way that they are. All right. Now, in, in 2011, you wrote a review entitled The Multiple Origins of Complex Multicellularity. What do you mean by multiple? The reason I'm asking this is because I have a hard time with, I've been told that all life has a common origin, and therefore, if you mean multiple independent origins, I have a problem with that because no two creators on, this, on Earth are independent of each other, in, at least in the mathematical sense. Right. So, but I hear biologists say independent species, independent species, and, and particularly Simon Conway Morris has talked about how uh, the eye and other things have evolved convergently. From, right. But when, but I then hear people talk about deep homology, and I think I'm more on a deep homologist. Say, well, wait a minute, Ver octopus eye and a vertebrate eye. Well, they had a common ancestor that had the same kind of pigments that are in both. So, what is your view on this this controversy? Okay, I think what we have to we have to distinguish among a couple of things here. When I say that something originated multiple times, I mean that there is no common ancestor of the organisms that have that trait that itself had the trait. That is to say, we have complex multicellularity in animals, we have it in plants, 
we have it in fungi, we have it in some red algae, but those organisms do not share a common, a common ancestor that was multicellular. So in that sense, I think unambiguously, multicellularity arose multiple times from single-celled organisms. Now, it gets more interesting when you think of what exactly are the prerequisites at the cellular level for multicellularity, and they would be things like molecules that make cells adhere to one another. That's the most basic feature of multicellularity. These are cadherins, I guess? Uh, in, well, we'll get back to this. There are cadherins in more advanced animals. Plants adhere by a totally different set of molecules. So, totally different. So they don't, but I thought all molecules or all proteins had a common ancestor, just like all species have a common ancestor. Yeah, but that, you know, you can, you can make this into sort of, you don't want to trivialize it this too, too much. In fact, uh, in terms of the things that make cells ad adhere, plants have hemicellulosis, pectins, and all of which are, 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 are proteinaceous, which cause adherence. And those are very different molecules than the molecules that make animal cells. But I'm very different from a fish, and we still have a common ancestor. Yeah. And, which had, and, which bilaterally symmetric, had two eyes, had vertebrate, had even knees, pectoral fins. <laughs> So un unambiguously, but that doesn't help you much when we're comparing you to a plant, which has none of those things. Uh, what you carry, we're both all eukaryotes. Yeah, but that's you know, that's fine. But let's go back and think about what it is that makes multicellularity possible. One is cell adhesion. One is cell communication, so that a signal from one cell can actually have an influence on another, and, and the third is a developmental program that basically allows cells within the same body to differentiate into different cell types. You have that, plants have that, but the molecules that do those jobs are very difficult. So I think I would line up with- Very or, difficult or very different? Very different, very sorry. Different, yeah. So I think I would, on, on this issue, I would line up with the Conway Morrises of the world and say that complex multicellularity truly has arisen multiple times. It was achieved through series of molecular and cellular structures that although, yes, at, at heart, they are all variations on a eukaryotic cell, the types of molecules that are involved are, are really, really quite different. Um, so different molecules have been uh, recruited to do similar jobs. And at the end of the day, the organisms are functionally very different. I mean, you're a, a heterotroph that gets your food by ingesting things. A, a fungus is a heterotroph that essentially uh, ramifies its body so that it can absorb nutrients. Plants are photosynthetic for the most part. So I, I think the points of distinction among the several groups of complex multicellular organisms uh, are distinct enough that I think we can say with some confidence that this is something that happened more than once. In your article, you talk about simple uh, multicellularity, yeah. which I guess microbes have, yeah. and uh, then you talk about complex. But as I read it, I said, well, wait a minute, there surely must be everything in between, simple and complex, and, and is that, why do you well, bin so, yes. binarize it? Um, I, I think the, the reason to make a difference is that when someone simply says, let's talk about multicellularity, you're talking about something that is very common. Uh, many different bacterial groups are form simple filaments, which are multicellular. Some cyanobacteria even differentiate multiple cell types. Two, uh, three types? How many yeah, types? About three. Three? Yeah. So at the ends and... Well, there are, within one group of cyanobacteria, there are cells that are specialized for nitrogen fixation and some that are specialized as kind of protective reproductive cells. That's, it, that's about it. But isn't there a range of complexity there? Not a whole lot. I mean, the, the, at, its, at its height, it's simple. And there's, there is, to the best of my knowledge, no bacterial organism that 
really has anything like the complexity that we would associate with a plant or animal. So let's go to the eukaryotes. And there, there are dozens of different groups that have evolved multicellularity in the sense of being filaments, sheets of cells, or balls of cells. Now, in almost all of these cases, almost all the cells within the body are the same. and They are all, all pretty much totally functional. Um, all of them are in direct contact with the environment and their nutrition and signaling from the environment depends on that. And so that kind of thing is widespread. It appears to be fairly simple to form. In fact, when you look in the cases where we know what the genome size is between simple multicellular organisms and their closest relatives that are single cells, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, and now that stands, I think, in contradistinction to things like plants and animals where we are three-dimensional. Most cells are not in contact with the environment. And uh, in fact, in your body, you need a circulatory system. You need an active bulk transport system to get things like oxygen and nutrients to the tips of your toes. Um, and so to me, a complex multicellular system is one where you have differentiation of cells, tissues, even organs, you have, because of those tissues and organs, organisms can actually circumvent the limitations of diffusion. You don't have to be right next to the environment in order to function. Um, and with that comes new possibilities for both morphology and behavior. That kind of multicellularity is pretty rare. That's only happened a handful of times. And you say, well, is there, is there in fact a continuum between these, the single cells and the complex multicellular things? And the answer is in some groups we see that continuum. I think logically the groups that have complex multicellular today had to evolve from simpler ancestors. And if we look in the plant lineage and closely related green algae, we see evidence of that continuum because the organisms that form the intermediary groups are still with us. In animals, not so much. How about you know? sponges? Well, sponges are, yeah, sponges are fairly simple, but they do have a complex embryology. Um, you know, the sister group of sponges is a single celled uh, group of, of organisms. Sponges, uh, I'll grant the point that they are much simpler than most more complex animals. So you could probably, you know, have a barroom argument about whether you should draw the line of complex multicellularity at the level of before sponges or between sponges and all other animals that basically have. No, I'd rather have the argument of not drawing a boundary at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's, yeah. I mean, who cares? Who, well, <laughs> you care because it's in your title of your review. You well, care. I mean, the, the, point, the point is not where you draw the boundary, it's where you get at the end of the day, right? And I would argue that at the end of the day, things that have circulatory systems, that have digestive systems, that have nervous systems, are a different kind of beast than things that are just a, a group of cells. So we'll agree, and actually, if you read that article, you'll find at the end that it says that the path to complex multicellularity is a corridor and not a door, and because I, 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 I acknowledge all the points that you're saying, but I think the important thing is, is where you end up. Just as an aside, with sponges, do you happen to know if they're monoclonal or not, or are they mosaic? Do they all have the same DNA, all these coenocytes? Um, I, I think they're monoclonal in that, same, that sense, that, that the entire sponge body develops from a single fertilized egg. Yeah. But, are, but there are other colonial organisms which are not monoclonal. You might know more about that than I do. I know. I no, definitely do not know. I just was wondering about that issue of when so organisms, for example, a cellular slime mold. All right, they come together and form that stalk. Now, yes. I think that they're not monoclonal. I think yes, no, that's a very different thing. And, and it's, that's a, a good point to bring up. And it does say that there are different ways to skin this particular cat. And so in, 
uh, a slime mold, which is multicellular for part of its life cycle, it's an aggregative multicellularity. That is, some signal actually makes what are basically amoebas come together and make this, this stalk. I, I if I'm not mistaken, for all animals, the individual develops from an embryo, which develops from a, a single fertilized cell. And I think the same thing would be true of plants as well. So those things are, you know, truly a, a, an individual that is developing from a fertilized, single fertilized right. egg. Right. And so the cellular slime mold, when it forms this slug, is not an animal. No, and it's on a completely different branch of the, the eukaryotic tree. I, I think what it tells you, and, and the reason why developmental biologists sometimes get interested in things like slime molds, is that some of the signaling pathways they have are reminiscent of signaling pathways we see elsewhere. Okay, so in this debate between deep homology and convergence, you, right. you kind of taking the size of the Con Conway Morrises of the world. You yeah. think that convergence is something useful. Now, why that's important to astrobiologists is because if we have evidence for the independent evolution of this particular feature, like an eyeball or motion or the division between plants and animals, anything, if we have independent examples of that on Earth, then that becomes a better candidate for existing elsewhere. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a reasonable argument, and it goes back to the big problem of trying to understand life in the universe from our example of one. Um, well, if you have multiple origins of a particular well, feature, right. well, then well, that's we have, not we one, have one example of life. <laughs> so, you know, one can say, well, if we find life elsewhere, will it be based on carbon? And I think I could make a good argument that, that it will be. On the other hand, if you say, well, will it have DNA? Well, it'll have some sort of informational macromolecule, but my faith in that it will replicate terrestrial life at that level is declines. And so Con it goes... Conway Morris thinks you will have DNA. Well, he's welcome to that opinion. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, the, in other words, there's convergence, there's strong convergence and, I guess, weaker convergence on Europe. Well, I mean, the, the, there's an argument to be made that the first organisms didn't have DNA, that DNA comes along well after the origin of, of life from uh, basically because it's better at storing information uh, than, than RNA is. But you know, I, I guess maybe it's, it's, it's a defect in my character, but if there's something that I'm never going to be able to get an answer to, I'm not gonna get too upset about the opinions that people hold on the question. <laughs> so so the, what, it would be nice though if there were a way to experimentally test what's going to be the case. That's right. Uh, but this gets back to the, to the issue that, that you raised. We might feel a little better about suggesting that something will happen on another planet if we know that it happened more than once on this planet. And I, I think that's a, a reasonable idea. Um, you know, I, I, I think that we may or may not have multicellular organisms on another planet. In part, that will depend on the nature of the environment. I mean, you can't, you know, you wouldn't have been able to survive for most of Earth history because there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere. So the, the physical history of the planet is not decoupled from, from biological history. But I think it, it, you know, these arguments do at least say, yeah, if you get to the stage of having a single-celled organism that has a kind of genetic regulation of the type that we have in eukaryotes today, yeah, then multicellularity is not, not unexpected. Um, again, how far you want to take those arguments, that's well, a matter of personal Let's take preference. it as far as a head. Now, do you think there are independent origins of heads, or are heads monophyletic? Um, I think that heads are monophyletic. So that means we should not expect aliens to have heads. Well, we, we don't know. Um, I, I think it does make sense that if you have multicellular organisms that make their living by eating other organisms, that there is some functional advantage to having a nervous system which is aggregated and that allows you to sense your environment and respond to that environment through directional movement. 
And that is actually, in, in some ways, a description of bilaterally symmetrical animals. But they only evolved them. once, though. But that's right. So they're monophyletic. So, so they're not a good candidate. So you for have, well, but but it, that the question then is: Is convergence the only argument in town when you're arguing about the likelihood of something uh, evolving? The argument that I just made is not an argument of convergence. It's an argument of function. That is that it is not unreasonable to think that in a world where you have multicellular organisms that eat other organisms, that there will be some functional advantage to having something that we might call a head. It might not be homologous to the heads we know, but something that aggregates you know, the nervous system perception of the world and responses to it. Well, it'll definitely not be homologous. It might be yeah. analogous, but it won't be an homologous because yeah, it won't have a right. um, Now, you were aware of 1995, the debate between Ernst Meyer, who I guess was here, that's right, and uh, with Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan would said a little something similar to what you just said about heads. He said it about human-like intelligence. Yeah, he expected there to be in the universe functionally equivalent humans. And Ernst Meyer, the biologist, the ornithologist, says, no way, you don't know enough biology, and that's not, you shouldn't expect that. So do you take a, a, a side in this debate? Oh, uh, not, not, not really. I mean, I always find it interesting that uh, you can take two books that many people who are interested in these questions have, have read. There was a nice book called Rare Earth by Peter Ward and Don Brownlee some years ago, in which they concluded that life was probably widespread in the universe, but intelligent life was rare. And Simon Conway Morris then wrote a book, Crucible of Creation, in which he argued that the hard part was making life in the first place, and basically the evolutionary history as it's played out on Earth is more or less inevitable once you got going. Mm -hmm. And what I always find interesting about that is that they are arguing from this exactly the same set of observations. It is the diversity and history of life on this planet and if you know, smart people can come to such diametrically opposed conclusions, maybe we just don't have a lot of purchase on this particular argument. And any, is any part of your research trying to get a purchase on this argument? Um, not in, in a direct way. I mean, what the things that we do on a daily basis are A, just try to build up the empirical record of the history of life on Earth as it interacts with environments. And I suppose I could put my hat in as an astrobiologist just dipping my toes into the water because I've been working on a Mars mission for the last 13 years. Um, and there we're actually finding evidence for environmental history of another planet, but to date nothing that I think would get you too excited about life. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, short of finding evidence of life on other planets, what will actually get you past the he said, she said type of argument that exists between, say, Ward and Conway Morris. So I, I, I think that what we as a scientific community can do is simply support the efforts of people who are trying to explore the universe and, <laughs> well, and find out empirically if somebody else. You have another there. colleague, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, mm -hmm. who was uh, had a gigantic debate, differences with uh, Simon Conway Morris, and, and Stephen Jay Gould has this analogy of, hey, let's replay the tape of life, what would you get? And he, I think, said many times in his writings that I don't think you'd get anything like humans again, and Simon Conway Morris says, sure you would, every time. So <laughs> uh, you must have known Stephen Jay Gould? Or? Yeah, he was actually one of my teachers. In okay, so, so what do you think of his argument there? Well, I, I, to be honest, I think Steve sort of overstated the case. Um, I think at the time that Steve made those remarks in, in a book called Wonderful Life, which is a really interesting book, this was at the time when I think paleontologists and biologists were first coming to appreciate the evolutionary importance of mass extinction. Um, you know, considering how important we think mass extinction is today. It's amazing how little attention was given to it before the 1980s. And I think Steve's point was that there are these contingent things. 
um, that might brachiopods not have been more important in the oceans today were it not for massive volcanic eruptions that caused them mostly to go extinct 250 million years ago. Uh, might dinosaurs have had a longer and more interesting history had not a meteor hit the Earth 66 million years ago? And, and those, are, those are, are reasonable arguments. On the other hand, a lot of types of life persisted through those environmental changes. And so I, I, while I take Steve's point that, you know, in, under a different set of events in Earth history, the history of life might have been somewhat different. I, I also take Conway Morris's point that there are trajectories in the history of life that go right through those mass extinctions. Things having to do with structure, of function, of energy metabolism. And, you know, you could probably throw brains in there too. <laughs> All right. Um, what is the evidence that RNA preceded DNA? Well, it's the, the major evidence, and again, it, it, it's, a, it's a view of, of life, is that well, to back up, one of the problems to early people thinking about the origin of life was what's commonly been viewed as a chicken and egg problem. That is, you need proteins to make nucleic acids and you need nucleic acids to make proteins. And what many people thought of as the solution to that chicken egg problem was when Tom Cech showed that RNA molecules could actually function uh, as catalysts the way proteins But do didn't we already know that by looking at the core of a ribosome? Uh, well, let's see. Tom Seitz got a Nobel Prize for looking at the core of the ribosome and showing that it was RNA. functional RNA, but only, I guess he got the Nobel Prize maybe 10 years ago. So this is, is you know, in terms oh. of the history of science, is, is fairly recent realizations. Oh, I didn't know. And so I think people you know, did cotton on to this idea that if you had one molecule that could be both informational and evolvable and functional, that that would be an attractive place to start. And, and RNA is, is that, that molecule. And, you know, DNA doesn't have, isn't as interesting functionally. D DNA is a great library. You know, if you store your books in a D DNA library, the DNA will keep the information fairly well. If there's no water around? Or well, or, yeah, or? Under, under any circumstances inside a cell. So I, I, I think there's something to be said for the idea that uh, one might start, at least in terms of the informational components of a system, with a single molecule, something like RNA, and then through time, you know, you start using structures that are better catalysts for many of those functional and, st and structural issues, and proteins uh, are what we have. And then you also have other molecules that become specialized for information storage. And so from that, that point of view, things like proteins and DNA could be thought of as specializations from a more okay. general precursor. A lot of students are interested in sex. And uh, you, I think, can tell us a little bit about the origin of sex and meiosis. Can't you? Or what? Well, I, I, can, I can tell you what, what I know, at least, and, and that is sex is something that is associated with eukaryotic organisms. Um, and when we think of sex, we think uh, it as a, of it as a means of reproduction, so that a male and a female mate, the sperm and egg get together, and they make a third organism. Um, if you were single-celled, or at least were looking at single-celled eukaryotes, you'd get a very different view of sex. Uh, in single-celled organisms, when you have two cells mate, you actually have a net reduction in organisms. You go from two organisms to one organism with twice the number of chromosomes. And then you need something like meiosis to kind of get yourself back to that 
original genetic state. So in a sense, sex then is something that's predicated on two cells fusing, which they often do at the single-celled stage um, when conditions are not uh, amenable to growth. So it's, it's how cells hunker down, if you will. And then meiosis is a way of getting, getting around that. Now, it does look like the last common ancestor of all living eukaryotic cells already had mitosis and meiosis, so it had a, a sexual life cycle of the type we know. I think one of the big questions is you can read in commonly in textbooks that because of sexual recombination, we have genetic diversity in, in eukaryotes, and, and, and that's true, but it, it always was meant to suggest, I think, that you know, the reasons that bacteria were lowly and always will be lowly is because they didn't have sexual recombination, therefore they didn't have this great engine of diversity. But, you know, in the age of genomics, we know that bacteria are hugely variable. And they can get new genes and new variants on genes by getting, you know, materials, genetic materials from other cells across really the whole domain of life. So one of the very interesting and I think unsolved questions is not so much why do we have sex in eukaryotes, but why don't eukaryotes have this really well-developed ability to assimilate DNA from the environment and from, from other cells? You know, in some ways, we seem almost depauperate relative to what bacteria can do. Um. Speaking of horizontal gene transfer, Carl Woes was talking about a Darwinian threshold, and he talked about somehow before there was this Darwinian threshold, there were, I guess, molecules and macromolecules that I guess could reproduce and would exchange things because I guess they didn't have any boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so he envisions this whole world of molecules that's just, just pure horizontal gene transfer and it's kind of strange to use the word transfer because there are no units to transfer yeah. between, but they're, it's just a soup of molecules. And then he says, oh, and then I guess there's a Darwinian threshold. Can you, do you know anything about that? Well, uh, only having read Carl's papers, and, I, and I, I think the idea that at some level there was more rampant exchange uh, horizontally than there is today, even among bacteria, is, is probably correct. And, and one can imagine that uh, you know, genetic complexity within cells could originate by you know, beginning with, to be trivial, 16 cell, different cells, each with one gene that were all different. And then through lateral transfer, you get one cell that has 16 genes, which has functional advantages. So that's the thing that reproduces. And, and so in, in some broad way, I, I like Carl's idea of being a threshold, whether, whether or not a Darwinian threshold is the right term for it, that there's a threshold which after it is passed, vertical transmission from parent to daughter becomes important in a way that it might not have been very early on. It's an interesting idea. Now, earlier in the interview, you, you defended the idea that you could make an argument for something existing elsewhere, not just based on convergence on Earth, but also on a reasonable estimate of some features, adapt, how adaptive it is. Is it useful? Uh, and you mentioned heads, for example. And, uh, oh, where was I going with this? Uh, but, but, oh, so if that's the case, if, if, if it is the case that human-like intelligence is somehow a convergent feature or it's so useful that Carl Sagan and many physicists think, well, there should be functionally equivalent humans elsewhere in the universe. Well, then where are they? What's, what's, the, what's your solution to the Fermi's paradox? Uh, I, I don't have a solution to it. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's an interesting conundrum, the whole idea that if intelligent life is, is uh, widely distributed in the, in the universe, why don't we hear from them more often? Uh, you know, one solution people have suggested is that if you're truly intelligent, the last thing you want to do is advertise your presence to other, other places. Um, I, I don't think we know. I, again, these are, these are interesting arguments to have. They're, they're fun. I, I think 
particularly to an astrophysicist, the idea that intelligent life must be widespread in the universe is enchanting because that justifies something like SETI, where you actually listen and, and, and hope to find it. And as I said earlier, I think in the absence of that kind of program, we will no never know anything about the presence or absence of life through most of the greater universe. Okay. And um, do, do you have any advice for students who to think about this question? I mean, you've run across students and they're probably full of misconceptions. What, what are the biggest misconceptions that you have seen students have about trying to think about this question? Let me think about that. Um, biggest misconceptions. Um, I'm not sure that most of the students I have are have, have misconceptions. I, I commonly run into students who think the questions of planetary exploration, extrasolar planets, the possibility of life elsewhere are important questions. And my advice to them is if you're going to be an astrobiologist, you should have a day job as well. And what I mean by that is um, it is a wonderful thing to take part in exploration of another planet. I've had the great privilege of doing that, and they're some of the best scientific experiences of my life. But by an optim optimistic guess, you know, there may be a meaningful lander mission to Mars or another planet every couple years for the next 20 years or so. Um, one of the questions is, what do you do the rest of the time? And, and coupled to that is, what gets you selected for those missions in the first place? And I, I think the answer to both cases is you develop a sense of research accomplishment on things you can do on this planet. So you can be a microbiologist, you can be a geologist working in deep time, you can be uh, an atmospheric scientist. And all of those things allow you on a daily basis to do experiments, modeling, and field work that helps you to understand this planet while giving you the skills to export that knowledge and those procedures to the study of, of other planets. And so I, I really think that the surest route to a meaningful career as an, an, an astrobiologist is to be good at biology or geobiology on Earth because that's why you're going to get chosen to actually work on a mission and that will allow you the, the great enjoyment and privilege of actually exploring other planets. Okay, and last question, are we alone? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, these really are barroom arguments. They're, they're, they're important questions. I, I don't want to minimize the importance of the question, but it's, in some ways it's premature to take a strong stance on issues where we have so little data. So I, I think I would celebrate the question without pretending we know enough to give an answer at this point.